The Ministry of Bearing We speak third of the service that consists in bearing others. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6.2 Thus the law of Christ is a law of bearing. Bearing means forbearing and sustaining. The brother is a burden to the Christian precisely because he is a Christian. For the pagan, the other person never becomes a burden at all. He simply sidesteps every burden that others may impose upon him. The Christian, however, must bear the burden of a brother. He must suffer and endure the brother. It is only when he is a burden that another person is really a brother and not merely an object to be manipulated. The burden of men was so heavy for God himself that he had to endure the cross. God verily bore the burden of men in the body of Jesus Christ, but he bore them as a mother carries her child, as a shepherd enfolds the lost lamb that has been found. God took men upon himself, and they weighted him to the ground, but God remained with them, and they with God. In bearing with men, God maintained fellowship with them. It is the law of Christ that was fulfilled in the cross, and Christians must share in this law. They must suffer their brethren, but, what is more important, now that the law of Christ has been fulfilled, they can bear with their brethren. The Bible speaks with remarkable frequency of bearing. It is capable of expressing the whole work of Jesus Christ in this one word, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Isaiah 53, 4-5 Therefore, the Bible can also characterize the whole life of the Christian as bearing the cross. It is the fellowship of the cross to experience the burden of the other. If one does not experience it, the fellowship he belongs to is not Christian. If any member refuses to bear that burden, he denies the law of Christ. It is, first of all, the freedom of the other person, of which we spoke earlier, that is a burden to the Christian. The other's freedom collides with his own autonomy, yet he must recognize it. He could get rid of this burden by refusing the other person his freedom, by constraining him and thus doing violence to his personality, by stamping his own image upon him. But if he lets God create his image in him, he, by this token, gives him his freedom and himself bears the burden of this freedom of another creature of God. The freedom of the other person includes all that we mean by a person's nature, individuality, endowment. It also includes his weaknesses and oddities, which are such a trial to our patients, everything that produces frictions, conflicts, and collisions among us. To bear the burden of the other person means involvement with the created reality of the other, to accept and affirm it, and, in bearing with it, to break through to the point where we take joy in it. This will prove especially difficult where varying strength and weakness in faith are bound together in a fellowship. The weak must not judge the strong. The strong must not despise the weak. The weak must guard against pride. The strong against indifference. None must seek his own rights. If the strong person falls, the weak one must guard his heart against malicious joy at his downfall. If the weak one falls, the strong one must help him rise again in all kindness. The one needs as much patience as the other. Woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Ecclesiastes 4.10 It is doubtless this bearing of another person in his freedom that the scripture means when it speaks of forbearing one another. Colossians 3.13 Walk with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Ephesians 4 2. Then, besides the other's freedom, there is the abuse of that freedom that becomes a burden for the Christian. The sin of the other person is harder to bear than his freedom, for in sin, 
fellowship with God and with the brother is broken. Here, the Christian suffers the rupture of his fellowship with the other person that had its basis in Jesus Christ. But here, too, it is only in bearing with him that the great grace of God becomes wholly plain. To cherish no contempt for the sinner, but rather to prize the privilege of bearing him, means not to have to give him up as lost, to be able to accept him, to preserve fellowship with him through forgiveness. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. As Christ bore and received us as sinners, so we in his fellowship may bear and receive sinners into the fellowship of Jesus Christ through the forgiving of sins. We may suffer the sins of our brother. We do not need to judge. This is a mercy for the Christian, for when does sin ever occur in the community that he must not examine and blame himself for his own unfaithfulness in prayer and intercession, his lack of brotherly service, of fraternal reproof and encouragement, indeed for his own personal sin and spiritual laxity by which he has done injury to himself, the fellowship, and the brethren. Since every sin of every member burdens and indicts the whole community, the congregation rejoices in the midst of all the pain and the burden the brother's sin inflicts that it has the privilege of bearing and forgiving. Behold, you bear them all, and likewise all of them bear you, and all things are common, both the good and the bad. Luther. The service of forgiveness is rendered by one to the others daily. It occurs without words in the intercessions for one another, and every member of the fellowship who does not grow weary in this ministry can depend upon it that this service is also being rendered him by the brethren. He who is bearing others knows that he himself is being born, and only in this strength can he go on bearing. Then, where the ministry of listening, active helpfulness, and bearing with others is faithfully performed, the ultimate and highest service can also be rendered, namely, the ministry of the Word of God.